Hello all of you. Welcome to the second class of amendment direct taxes for the financial year 20 to 23. And this is applicable for all the exams of 2023. Then CA, CMA, inter and final. For CMA final, as promised, those who have all purchased the lectures for CMA final, one more third amendment lecture will come. That will be exclusively for final students for the, all the amendments in appeals and other topics. But tax amendment lecture one, that is all your amendment in the slab rates and uh, your heads of income we have covered in the first amendment lecture. And this today's amendment lecture is all the amendments related to TDS and return. And there are three most important amendments to be discussed and starting right now is 194R, 194S, two new sections introduced in TDS, then updated return and small but very important amendments in 234H and so on. Yes, sure. Shall we do one thing before starting with this? Let us go to the first amendment also and just an overview. Detailed lecture is already there in the YouTube. And for your convenience, dear students, I have made a playlist. If you check playlist wise, there's a playlist for all the tax amendment videos for financial year 20 to 23. Added very soon will be all the amendments of GST also in that. And there are there is a separate uh, playlist for all the revision videos. Headwise and Marathon 2 lectures are there for direct taxes, covering up the concepts so that whenever you are free, sometimes you are in study mode core, you are doing your studies good. If you are traveling or if you are not in your study mode, just put the headphones and keep on revising the marathon booster notes lectures for costing, for taxation, for accounts, for all my three subjects I have given. And surely with repeated reading, your pen will flow in exam. Okay. Yes. And the material which I'm using right now, PDF is already uploaded in concept classes app. The link of the app is there. And if you still have doubt, see amendments, I'll tell you today's topic, updated return is like everyone is interpreting in different way. Updated return is clear, 139.8a newly added section. But there are loopholes in that which are not clear and someone is saying this, that. So it will go on. And we are studying for the best to score best marks in exam and gain the practical knowledge. So if you have any doubts after watching this lecture, make sure you are joining our Telegram group. You can put me a voice note over there. Click the picture and send. I'll surely clear it myself for all of you. Okay. And updates are there already in the... Uh, as I told you, the updates are already there in this PDF material is already there. Yeah, in the concept classes app, the link is given. Yeah, these are the amendments we have discussed in slab rates and tax rates. There is no much change except that now long term capital gain, not only long term capital gain on shares, which is taxable at 10%, one lakh more is exempt and remaining taxable at 10%, but now all. All the long-term capital gain, additional rate of surcharge, that is 25% and 37% uh, are not applicable. So even if you have a long-term capital gain of 8 crore rupees, highest rate of surcharge will be 15%. 25% and 37% surcharge rates are, I'm just explaining in brief, the original way, dear students, two minutes listen, you go to tax video one, the background, what it was, now why it has changed is there in detail. But repetition is required, so I'm revising. Today's video, I will go into detail. Pehle aise tha, ab aise hai, and what are the changes? Okay? So this one is in brief to tell you that there are four cases wherein higher surcharge rate of 25% and 37% are not applicable. They are short-term capital gain on shares, long-term capital gain on shares, dividend income, and any other long-term capital gain, whether you sell property or jewelry or anything. So these are four cases on which higher surcharge rate of 25% and 37% are not applicable. 10 or 15% will only be applicable. And one more change here is now cooperative society also, the surcharge rates are exactly like domestic company. From 1 crore to 10 crore, 7%. 
seven uh, 10 crore and above it is 12 percent just like domestic company you have the cooperative society okay cash credit some small amendment is there that the person who is giving you loan also if he is not able to explain that that if you have taken entry in your books fine but if you have taken loan from me and if I'm not able to explain from where did I get the money to give loan to you, dear students, then it will be added in your income. You can read all this or watch the video again. Medical facility, COVID, if there's a death or anything, an employer is reimbursing, it's not income. But if the reimbursement is 15 lakhs and actual expense is 8 lakhs, remaining will be taxable as salary. Same thing as an individual, if you are getting any help from any trust or any person and see if it is <clears throat> employer employee relationship it will be taxable under salary but for anything else it will be taxable under income from other sources okay right in business head um, this we have discussed latest amendment last time hmm? that is um, any expenditure related to exclusively hmm? For uh, illegal purpose, if you're doing it, will not be allowed under Section 37. For example, GST is allowed as expense, interest on GST. But if you're paying penalty for GST, why you pay penalty for GST? You must have done something wrong. So if you're paying penalty for GST, so any expense you have done, though core related to business, but it is a prohibited expense, not allowed legally, it will not be allowed under General Section 37 also. Okay, right. 43B, some small amendment for debentures and all, check it. Yeah. In slum sale and all the cases, now we have to take the fair market value as the sale consideration. Hmm? Fair market value. Slum sale is when you lump sum sell your business in case of capital gain. So it is the fair market value of consideration received or fair market value of the asset given up whichever is higher you live say whatever money you get if the premium yearly premium exceeds two lakh fifty thousand for single policy or for two three policies taken together if your premium exceeds two lakh fifty thousand then on maturity whatever amount you get it will be taxable under uh, capital gains okay Maturity amount of this kind of LIC, where the premium exceeds 2,50,000 will not be exempt under section 10, 10D. Done? I don't know, some of you may be feeling I'm going a little fast, but uh, I thought as the message is dropped in, I should revise one, so I'm doing that. But detailed, if you want to learn it, check the other video. That's also just one hour video and worth it. Watch the first video. Yeah, virtual digital asset, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and all is taxable flat at 30%, no expense, nothing. And even the uh, TDS will be deducted, which we are going to check now. 194S may. 194S may, if you are transferring virtual digital asset, then TDS is deducted at the rate of 1% of the transfer amount. Okay, right. Yeah, whenever the property is sold, irrespective of the actual sales consideration, we take sales consideration as stamp duty value. Then TDS will also be deducted on stamp duty value and not on actual sale consideration. Is this clear to all of you? Huh? I've sold you the house for 80 lakhs. Actual stamp duty is 100 lakhs, 1 crore. TDS under 194 IAM all will be deducted on 100 lakhs. Though money I have received is 80 lakhs. But the buyer will deduct TDS not on actual sales consideration, but on stamp duty value if that is higher. And that is considered for capital gain. Income from other sources, COVID-related extra money, what you receive will be taxable. In case of raid and all, whatever income you get, no set-offs are allowed. Hmm? And startup companies, they can set up the startup till March 24. So with this, we complete the revision. Yeah. And here we start with text amendment lecture 2. Any doubts you have in lecture 1 and 2, just message me in the Telegram group. We'll surely clear it.
Today's tax amendment lecture is most important as it is covering up your topic of TDS, which is in itself having a weightage of eight marks. Both CA or CMA exam, you get four bits of two marks each. How much TDS will be deducted under what section at what rate and beyond what limit? Like if I am uh, getting income from lottery up to 10,000 TDS is not deducted. Beyond that, TDS is deducted at the rate of 30%. If I'm deducting TDS of an NRI, it has to be with surcharge and ESIS. So like this, as it is, this topic is very important, dear students. And along with this, surely in the upcoming exam, eight marks, you will get the questions from return topic. Return of income is divided into two parts. Return of income, different kind of returns. And who will sign? That is one part. And your PAN. Who should obtain the PAN? In what cases you should quote the PAN? If you don't have PAN, what? If PAN is linked with Aadhaar or not linked? So these two topics are otherwise also very important. Spare good quality time, as good as your heads of income and do these topics. Okay? This is a trend of the last few exams I'm sharing with all of you. Chalo. The first amendment in today's lecture, what we are discussing is TDS on benefit or perquisite in respect of business or profession, section 194R. Okay. And one important part is these amendments in TDS, they are for financial year 22 23, assessment year 23 24. But sometimes, if these amendments are technical, you know, there are so many questions in everyone's mind here now how they are going to tax it. So instead of 1st April 22, Many times these amendments are brought in from 1st July. That's why 194R is introduced from 1st July 2022. To explain it, I'm giving you an example first. And once I complete that, no, you don't have to draw the example or you can take a screenshot if you want. But uh, the thing is, Example say ye clear hoga aur fir jab hum padhenge to aapko achche se samajh mahega. You'll understand it better. I am saying 194R says if there is any perquisite or benefit given above rupees 20,000 in financial year 22-23 then TDS is to be deducted. Yes, all terms, limits, amounts, everything I'll clear. Hmm? Then TDS is to be deducted. One second, is the screen clear or not? Yeah, at the rate of 10%. Now, first thing is, what do you mean by perquisite or benefit? Perquisites or benefits can be in cash, it can be in kind, it can be in reimbursement, okay? And that too, these are all like related to business. If the employer gives perquisites or benefits to employees, are they taxable? Employer gives salary, bonus, allowances and perquisites. So any perquisite receivable by employee from the employer it is very well taxable under the head salary. We have already done that, RFA and all. So everyone is clear with the meaning. What do you mean by perquisite? Perquisite is benefit in kind or sometimes in cash indirectly. So this benefit is given to say third parties or anyone related to our business. Then we need to deduct TDS. Hmm? So A has given perquisite or benefit to say B of 30,000 rupees during the year. In kind, A is doing business with B. B is giving awesome business to A and A is gifting rupees 30,000 worth tab ya laptop to B. A ne B ko kya diya? Laptop. Why? B is employee of A? No. It's a business party, but who brings business from third parties? You know, Aadatya, commission basis. B is not my employee. But he's bringing awesome business. 
and I want to give him a tablet tab of 30,000 rupees. Now, this is a gift from or benefit from A to B. A should deduct TDS at the rate of 30,000 into 10% that is 3,000 and give the benefit of 20,000. But ma'am, this 30,000 is given in cash, uh, sorry, kind. In that case, we will make sure that 3,000 cash is received from B first. B, we are giving you a benefit of 30,000. In that 3,000 is the TDS. This is the gross amount. And net benefit should come to you 27,000 B. <clears throat> but B, listen, if you're getting a benefit of 30,000, then make sure you give us 3,000. I hope you are getting. I am giving you a benefit of 30,000. But 3,000, again, I'm saying, listen, on this 30,000, 3,000 is the tax I need to deduct under section 194R and pay to government. So take this 30,000 tax. But against this 10% TDS, you give and I'll pay to government. One way out. Or I can gross up the benefit. Or I can ask B to show that on 30,000, he has already paid the tax. So this is how they are going to regulate 194R payment strategy. Generally, the benefit which is given in cash, they will deduct 10% and give. If the benefit is given in kind, can we take reverse money from B? Because B, in your hand, the net benefit should come 27. And your tax I'm paying to government and I'll give you a certificate. So better if instead of 27, I'm giving you 30,000 benefit, 3,000 you pay me in cash. Or show it to me that you have paid advance tax on this 30,000. But tell me one thing for A, He's giving the perquisite or benefit. For B, this perquisite or benefit received may be business income or taxable under 28 or other source or whatever. Is it mandatory that when the benefit goes from A to B, B should show it as taxable? Answer is that is not look out of A. Are you all getting? A is giving perquisite or benefit in cash or in kind to B above 20,000. Then should B compulsory show it as business income generally? Yes. But if they're showing or not, that responsibility is not for A. Now here, if this TDS rate kaise deduct hoga ye clear hai, I'll read out all the points from material. This is just all for explanation. Second point is though this section is applicable from 1st July 2022, this is applicable. 194R, but rupees 20,000 perquisite or benefit in cash and kind, this limit is to be checked from 1st April 2022 to 31st March 2023. Are you all with me? Ma'am, but you said the section is applicable from July. Yes. But 20,000 pure saal ka limit. The throughout the year, if I have given you uh, 5, 5,000, 5 benefits. How many things I have given you in kind? 25,000 yearly is the limit. And this will become taxable. Clear to all of you. Now, I told you this is like, that's why guidelines and circulars I am clarifying 10 points now. You will have 11th and 12th doubt. Absolutely open. I am ready to make one more video based on your doubts. Please keep sending your doubts. Though 1st July say you have to apply. <clears throat> limit you have to check from 24th. Now 1st April 2022 to 30 June 22 only it has crossed 20,000. Is TDS applicable? Answer is not applicable. Are ma'am, you said you have to check the limit from April. Correct. But in April to June only, 50,000 benefit is given. We will not deduct TDS because TDS is to be deducted from 1st of July. 
only for limit checking we are doing from April, but whatever benefits are provided from April, May, and June, even if it is crossing 20,000, TDS is not applicable. It is applicable from July onwards. And once it exceeds, say, 30,000, can we say, ma'am, 20,000 tak to limit allow karo? Answer is no. Once it crosses 20,000, then whatever yearly benefit you have given, you have to deduct TDS at the rate of 10% and pay it to government. Theek hai? On perquisites and benefits. Now, perquisites and benefits in cash, in kind, or are included. Very popular example, which is discussed in the uh, guidelines is uh, social media, what you give as um, advertisement. Huh? I'll give an example of Big B, Amitabh Bachchan. Amitabh Bachchan does advertisement so many. He's like workaholic, no? appreciated at this age. So whatever he gets from ads from that KBC show, he's working. So Amitabh Bachchan is doing the ad of Bikaji. Huh? Bikaji, snacks, he's doing some ad. So now the company gave him these products to do advertisement and later on they take it back. Is it a benefit for Amitabh Bachchan? Answer is no. But if they are, you know, putting it all on his sofa table, more than 30,000 rupees ke pure packets, sachets, yevo, whatever. And they say, Amit sir, you keep all these snacks now. Okay. So like this, any product, you are doing, say, advertisement for cameras. And these cameras are worth 1 lakh, 2 lakh. And that camera, they give it to you. Is it the benefit flowing from the company to you? Yes. Will it be taxable? Yes. Will it be tedious? Will it be deductible under 194 hour? Answer is yes. Huh? All this is printed very clearly in the material. So you have to download the material and I'm just explaining in my way. Sometimes say Z has taken loan. Okay. And he has to repay in 12 installments from the bank. Z has taken a loan from the bank and he has to repay in 12 installment. Banks do one-time settlement. Pay 11 installments. What is bank saying? 11 installments pay karo, khatam karo. I am repeating. Bank is saying you have to pay 12 installments. You are doubtful you will pay or not. One shot if you are paying 11 installments. Instead of paying it in 11 months, if you are ready to pay 12 months, sorry. If you are ready to pay all the installments together, one time settlement, pay 11 installments. One installment is waived. Is the installment waived a perquisite or a benefit? Then the guidelines are saying no. Loan repayment, ke vakt, whatever one installment is waived off, that is not to be taken as perquisite and benefit. Like this, one more very popular example in the guidelines is bonus issue. On original shares, bonus shares are given free. You all know the story. Bonus issues there in accounts, journal entries, in law. Huh? So these bonus issues are like uh, given to the shareholders free. Now, I hope if you understand this at the core base level, it's not given free. It's your own reserves which are capitalized. Reserves are reduced and capital is increased. No money is flowing from the shareholder to the company. So in bonus issue, is it treated as perquisites or benefit and should 194R apply? Answer is no. 194R will not apply. But very popular and very much in our schemes of the companies. Suppose you are a dealer in Sony TVs. So if the showroom is purchasing 12 TVs, OLEDs, showroom is purchasing 12 TVs, OLED, plus two TVs, OLEDs are given as perquisite. OLEDs are very costly, say, and that two huge size 
2 lakhs each so a new showroom is opening up and that electronic showroom directly from the agency of the sony is ready to buy 12 oleds at a time and the company is saying if you pay 12 down payment instead of 2 months credit we'll give you two more oleds the two extra oleds given by the company to the showroom are they perquisite or benefit answer is yes and 194r is applicable everything i'll read out from your notes also keep patience and i cannot go for any shortcut in these topics today's topics are super interesting if i say ha huh? this 139 it takes up so whatever i could give best gist i have given let us see the gist once 194 r says when you give perquisite or benefit to anyone from the business then tds is to be deducted at the rate of 10% if the benefit throughout the year exceeds 20000 though this section is applicable from 1st of july for counting 20000 limit you have to check the limit throughout the year in case the limit has exceeded from april may june there itself then don't give extra huh don't um, give like uh, extra benefit like june ke baad he you will deduct the tds uh, april to june if, even if the limit is exceeded it's not counted okay and whenever the limit exceeds can you say up to 20000 limit to ma'am allowed and of the remaining 10 pay tds cut or no in all the sections of tds it is like that once you exceed the limit on the whole amount tds is deducted social media if they give the product to the advertiser whoever is advertising and all in that case it will be treated as perquisite and 194 um r bilkul lagega if the product is handed over it's handed over or given to amita bachan loan waiver for repayment at a time if you repay 11 installments at a time then 12th one will be waived off it's not 194 r will not be applicable bonus issue it's not applicable but in case of schemes and all it is applicable and very important point is whoever is receiving uh, receiving the perquisite or benefit they are showing as section 28 income or not no issues while deducting tds i am not bothered if i am giving you a perquisite or a tablet you are showing it as your income okay right receiver can capitalize the perk received capitalize the perk received and charge depreciation dear students see these points are not different but they are new for you so surely please make me a promise you are going to watch it two times it will be like super clear first you listen to this pdf download kar lo print nikal lo read the material and then again go to this once again please perquisite receive and charge depreciation what what do you mean by this point i'll tell you i am giving a tablet to my um parties who did business above a limit now these kind of tablets is this is it their business income yes shall i deduct the tds yes can you show it as tablet account debit to perquisite business income you are showing it as income but can you capitalize in your books and then charge depreciation on that laptop or computer or tablet which i have given you answer is yes the receiver can show it as income they can show it as uh, capital i mean say capitalize it in the books and charge depreciation but it doesn't have any concern with me for doing 194 r i think these many points are enough if anything is left out i'll tell you after reading from here chalo yahan bhi kuch bhi doubt hai to you ask me any person responsible for providing to a resident ha huh? it's not just only business business i am talking because usually the perquisites are given in business or they are given in salary employer par kahin pe bhi any person responsible for providing to any resident 
any perquisite or benefit in convertible money or not arising from business or excise of profession by such resident, tax is to be deducted. Tax is not required to be deducted where the provider of facility is an individual and HUF whose turnover does not exceed 1 crore. Giver is an individual and HUF and his turnover does not exceed 10, 1 crore means his books of accounts are not audited. So I hope you remember this is there for many other sections. In case of individual and HUF, TDS provisions are applicable only if their books of accounts are audited. That means if they have a business, their turnover exceeds 1 crore. If they are professionals, their turnover exceeds 50 lakhs. Okay? Person responsible for providing means the person providing such benefit or in case of company, the company itself, including the principal officer thereof. Hmm? So person responsible for providing means the person providing benefit or in case of company, company itself or officer. Hmm? So company can give the benefit to the other parties or companies and uh, like that. Before providing such benefit or perquisite to a resident, TDS should be deducted. It has to be deducted at the rate of 10% where the value or aggregate value of benefit is likely to exceed or does not exceed 20,000, then TDS is not applicable. Beyond 20,000, TDS is to be deducted. Where the benefit of perquisite as the case may be is wholly in kind or partly in cash and partly in kind, but such part of cash is not sufficient to meet up the liability. I'm not giving you benefit in cash so that I can deduct 10% TDS and pay to government. In such case, hmm, so, once again, very important, nice point. Huh? Where benefit of perquisite, as the case may be, is wholly in kind or partly in cash and partly in kind, but such part in cash is not sufficient to meet the liability of the TDS. The person responsible for providing benefit shall, before releasing the benefit, ensure that Tax required to be deducted has been paid in respect of benefit or perquisite. I'll make sure either I'm taking cash from you, sir, I'm giving you 30,000 laptop, 3,000 is TDS, you give it to in cash because otherwise always net benefit will come to you, 27. So you give 3,000 tax, I'll pay to government or you make sure 30,000 benefit I'm giving to you, <clears throat> you are paying tax on this advance tax, give me your receipt. I will fill up my forms accordingly. Hmm? So section is over. Just check if you have any doubt, ask me. <clears throat> clear? The basics are clear. Now the guidelines. 194 car cast an obligation on person responsible for providing any benefit or perquisite to deduct TDS at 10%, there is no further requirement to check whether the amount is taxable in the hands of recipient or not. I am giving you benefit, I will deduct TDS. You are showing it as business income or other source or not showing is your lookout. TDS is to be deducted irrespective of benefit is of revenue or capital nature for recipient. Whatever benefit I am receiving, is it your revenue income? Or is it your capital income, tablet account, debit to uh, the income, as I said, perquisite. So you are showing it as revenue or capital. I'm not bothered. You are showing it as income or not, not bothered. Loan waiver by bank for one-time settlement, 194R is not applicable. Yeah, this fourth point I missed out in the notes. So I will read out from here, valuation. When I have to deduct 10% TDS under section 194R, if I am giving the benefit in kind, on what value I should deduct the TDS? Very simple. If I have purchased 30,000 tab and given it to one of my parties, on purchase value 30,000 I will deduct. If I'm manufacturing my own 12 OLEDs and I'm giving two LEDs free, then what is the fair market value of the product? One time I said, now read. 
if the benefit per perquisite is purchased and then provided to you on purchase value 10% TDS. If the benefit of perquisite provider manufactures such item given as benefit and perquisite, the price that it charges to customer for such item. Are you getting? If I'm manufacturing 1200 OLEDs and I'm giving two to you in scheme, at what rate am I selling it on market? That's the fair market value. And on fair market value, TDS will be deducted. Easy? Now, it is further clarified that GST would not be there. This is now 194M and all the sections, rental wala 194I. On GST part, TDS is not deducted. Sometimes if I'm giving you a tab of 30,000, say 3,000 on that is the GST. And I am giving it to you 33,000. So TDS at the rate of 10% will be charged only on the benefit which is going from me to you, 30,000. GST is not a benefit. You are paying to me and I am paying to government like that. Same as in the rental and all the cases on GST, TDS is not deducted. Fifth point, I feel they can frame an MCQ and ask you, I hope all these examples which I'm drawing here and there, which I'm make up kar rahi, five day, clear hai nahi. Huh? If a <coughs> social media influencer is given a product like cosmetics, gadgets, etc. of a manufacturing company so that he can use it to make advertisement, then if the product is returned back, it's not a perquisite. I gave you, say, um, digital cameras to advertise and I took it back. It's not a perquisite. But if the product is retained by the user, whoever is doing my social media advertisement, then it is a perquisite. If it is retained by user, it is treated as perquisite TDRS. Am I going fast or clear? Dekho. Validation wala part clear hai. This is clear or not. If a person is providing benefit in kind to a recipient and tax is required to be deducted under section 194R, the person is required to ensure that the tax required to be deducted has been paid by the recipient. Huh? Either I will deduct the TDS and pay or you make sure. So such recipient would pay tax in the form of advanced tax. The deductor may rely on the declaration along with a copy of the advance tax provided by recipient confirming that tax required has been deposited. This would then be required to be reported in the TDS and 26Q. You know, all this is like practically when we do it, I have to deduct the TDS. If not, there's a facility in that utility that I can show your advance tax chalan number that I have given you a perquisite of 30,000 and you have already paid advance tax on that. Hmm? Right. Next is uh, 194 hour would come from 1st of July. It provides that provision of this section does not apply to any benefit uh, which does not exceed 20,000. It is not clear if this 20,000 is to be computed for whole financial year. Answer is yes. I felt as it is, they can ask you this question. Since threshold limit 20,000 is for financial year, calculation of aggregate benefit for 194 has to be taken from 1st April. I'm repeating 194R is applicable from 1st of July. But checking you have to do from 1st of April. Clear? Hence, if the value or aggregate value of the benefit provided or likely to be provided to a resident exceeds 20,000 during the financial year, the provisions of 194 hours shall apply on any benefit of perquisite after 1st July. For counting limit, you take throughout the year limit, but whatever benefit you have provided after, first, say from April to June only, you have provided 60,000 benefit, not taxable. Now 5,000 also, day one, say taxable. The same we have done, dear students, last year in 194Q. 
if your turnover exceeds 10 crores and all. The benefit of perquisite which has been provided on or before 30 June will not be subject to tax. In case of bonus shares which are issued by shareholders and all, okay, it has been represented. It does not result in any benefit to the shareholders. Frankly, they say bonus shares are issued free of cost, but I told you your own reserves take. This is your reserves. What are reserves? Profit which is not distributed to shareholder. I earned 100, I gave 20 profit, 80 I accumulated reserve. Now, if I'm giving you 80 and then saying, Achha, 80 ghar le ja ke kya karoge? you will distribute your debt, give it back to me. I will capitalize it. That's what is bonus issue. So in bonus issue, there is no actual benefit. So it is not going to be covered by 194R. Further cost of acquisition of bonus share is taken as nil. Hence, it's not practical to take 194R will not be applicable. That's all for 194R. What is the first thing? From where is it applicable? 1st July. Limit kap se dekhna hai? 1st April. How much amount of perquisite in cash or in kind? 20,000. At what rate TDS is to be deducted? 10%. In case of individual and HUF, only if the limit exceeds tax audit wala, 1 crore. And 10% is to be deducted on the purchase value if I purchase and provided you the benefit. If I am manufacturing myself, then whatever is the fair market value. Okay. And rest all is clear, I hope. Hmm? Next. Virtual digital asset, this is taxable. Already 115 BBH we have discussed. I think once again, we should go and discuss that first. Then this will be more like clear, clear, clear. You have already discussed here income from. In capital asset, they have added this definition. Huh? What is virtual digital asset? Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and all this. So section 115 BBH is going to be applicable. Hmm? This is also from 1st July 2022, which TDS part hai. And it clearly says that if this virtual digital currency is transferred, capital gain is going to be taxable. One second. Huh? Huh. Capital gain may is going to be taxable as a capital asset. Hmm? No deductions will be allowed. Tax rate will be 30% flat, no set off of losses, no basic exemption, no deduction of any cost, no indexation. But ma'am, the purchase cost of the virtual digital asset, will it be deductible? Answer is yes. Cost of acquisition is going to be deducted, but no other expenditure will be deducted. No basic exemption flat, it will be taxable at 30%. Okay? And for this reason, from 1st of July, this will surely come in two marks MCQ or in the form of a small two mark question in TDS. If you have transferred virtual digital asset, achha, did you observe one thing, dear students? There is no limit. Ki VDA ki value itne se jada hai, TDS will be deducted. So virtual digital asset, even if you have transferred 5,000, 1% on transfer value, TDS is deducted under 194S from 1st July 2022. This was all discussed detail. Same thing I have said here. Any person responsible for paying to any resident any sum by way of consideration for virtual decision has said. Okay. Right. Ramesh has sold. Virtual digital, shall I do it in the form of an example? Virtual digital asset to say Suresh worth 5 lakh rupees. Then TDS, who will deduct? Suresh will deduct. Suresh is purchasing from Ramesh. So Suresh should pay 5 lakh rupees sale consideration for purchasing virtual digital asset from Ramesh. So Suresh will deduct. TDS at the rate of 1%. Clear? A person responsible to pay to any resident, 
any sum by way of consideration for VDA at the time of credit or at the time of payment, whichever is earlier. Payment ya books mein entry abhi tak pay nahi kiya. Then also in March, I hope this you remember for interest and many other cases, TDS is deducted even if it is not paid. Interest account debit to interest payable to Suresh. Kar diya na TDS kaat lo. Hmm, one person. No tax shall be deducted where consideration is payable by a specified person. Value or aggregate value. Specified person is uh, individual and HF to tax audit. Wale hai. If the value of consideration does not exceed 50,000. Any other person, if the value of consideration does not exceed 10,000. Now for whom these uh, limits are there? Achha, limits are there. Huh? Sorry, one more section. They have not given the limits once again. Who are the specified person? Being an individual or HUF, whose sales, gross receipts or turnover from business carried on by him does not exceed 1 crore in case or 50 lakh. Means individuals and HUFs, jiske books of accounts audit, hote hain. they are called as specified person. And being an individual and HUF, not having profits and gains of business or profession. Okay? So the provisions, one second, this I'll explain later. First, let us see that if the consideration is payable, means if the buyer is individual and HUF, then above 50,000, if the VDA asset is purchased, TDS will be deducted at the rate of 1%. In all the other cases, other buyers, above 10,000, if VDA is purchased, TDS is deducted at the rate of 1%. Is this first part clear or not? Once again, even I thought like there are so many limits to be remembered, no? Hmm. 194R limit is 20,000. 194Q limit is there, turnover above 10 crores and now let us say 194S. Fir se karte Virtual digital asset is transferred. If the buyer is specified person, means individuals and HUFs whose books of accounts are audited, if they are purchasing above 50,000, TDS will be deducted at the rate of 1%. And if the buyer is any other person, then TDS will be deducted if it exceeds 10,000. Clear to all of you 10,000 and 50,000? Done. Specified person means a person being an individual or HF whose turnover or gross receipts exceeds 1 crore if he's doing business and professionals ke case mein 50 lakhs. Theek hai? Okay. Now, provisions of section 203A, TAN requirement and 206AB, higher rate of TDS in case of non-return filer. This anyhow I am going to explain. This may be a commandment hai. 206AB, so I will explain this. But TAN requirement and all is not required. Listen all of you to one thing. You remember there is one time buyer who is buying a property. And this is a seller and he has to deduct TDS under 194 IA and all. So there are three, four cases or uh, that 50 lakhs K above you are doing interiors and all 194 uh, M. Hmm? So there are sections wherein one time you need to deduct the TDS. Then TAN provisions are not applicable. Means this is the seller, this is the buyer. Buyer is deducting TDS 194 S at the rate of 1%, TAN is not required. And 206AAA, uh, what is that? I'll clarify now. When I go to that section, I'll tell you. Okay? Hmm. Achha, one more feature they have said here is, in case the transaction is covered by 194O, you have purchased the Bitcoin and all through e-commerce operator. And 194O is also applicable 
then tax shall be deducted under 194S. Take a pause. In case transaction to which 194O are also applicable along with this section, then 194S will overtake the O and 194S may TDS cutega. So if you're doing through e-commerce operator, uska 194 ho ka apna hai. Hmm? So this will be applicable. Where the consideration for transfer of virtual digital asset hmm, is in kind, where there is no part in cash or partly in cash and partly in kind. The person responsible for paying such consideration shall before uh, this all they will ensure that all that is paid on time. Are you getting? So uh, when I'm deducting TDS, I mean, say I'm transferring VDI to you. I'm transferring my Bitcoin to you and you have to deduct TDS. But you're not paying me the consideration in cash. You, just may, you are giving me other Bitcoin or something. Like this is a barter or whatever way. So in that case, we have to make sure that tax is paid. Okay, just like the section 194R we have done. I'm giving you benefit in kind, but I'm deducting the TDS and paying. So I'm taking that much cash from you or I'm making sure that you have paid advanced tax and in that you have covered. So practically there are many more guidelines to this, but too much in-depth is not required now. So I didn't give you much practical example. If I feel in the MTPs, RTPs, this is covered up too much and more problems we need to solve, surely I'll make the third amendment tax video hmm? for this. So 194R, for sake bar kare S, hmm? virtual digital asset when it is transferred, the buyer needs to deduct TDS under 194S at the rate of 1% if the transfer value exceeds 10,000. And if the buyer is individual in HF, then if the value exceeds 50,000. TK? Right. Uh, just few small changes are there in this. I will explain, but before that, I'm going in a different way. So let me mark the most important one. Uh, that is overseas tours and package, TCS. No amendment is there, but just to recollect, I have given you all this. Second one. Yeah, this is all for your revision. Huh? This one. That overseas tour package, if you give it to anyone, then you need to collect the TCS at the rate of 5%. Hmm? And if it is for education and all, then it is just 0.5% if it crosses. Ye sab same hai. But just for you to read it, I have given Amendment in this is very small. Tax collected at source provisions for these, you know, these are currency converters. Huh? Currency dealers, we call them as authorized dealers for currency conversion so that we can pay for our uh, uh, foreign trips, for our foreign education, for foreign health issues and all. This DCS provision is not applicable. Okay. If the buyer is a non-resident and he does not have a PE in India. If the buyer who is buy, who wants to buy currency, dollars and all, by giving rupees and all, he's an NRI. And he's not having any PE, place of establishment in India. To him, this TCS provisions of 206C1G is not applicable. But what are these limits and all are interesting? So just for reading, I have given you, okay? One more small amendment which we should do and then we should go for the updated return is 234H. You all know last day of linking your PAN and Aadhaar was 31st March 2022. Huh? It was earlier long back 20 and all, but then due to COVID, it was last date. They said Aadhaar or PAN link karna zaruri hai. Till 31st March 2022. If you don't link, your PAN will become inoperative. Okay. Now, if you have linked up the PAN and Aadhaar, uh, say up to 30th of June 2022, you can now do it. Linking you can do late. 
but how much will be the late fees under 234H? 500 if you have linked it till 30 June 22, 1000 in all the other cases. Once again, 234H says you need to link your Aadhaar and PEN by 31st March 2022. If you have not linked, your PAN becomes inoperative as if you don't have a PAN and higher rate of TDS and those are applicable. Ho Suppose you link up your PAN and Aadhaar late between 1st April 2022 to 31st Ma uh, June, sorry, 30th of June 22, these first three months, April, May, June. Then you have to pay the late fees of rupees 500 under 234H. And if you link it after that, then 1000. I know this is simple, but so many times asked in exam. So we are going now reverse. This is done. Now, cases wherein written TDS chapter is over. What are the two amendments, dear students, we have seen in TDS? Bina screen K 194R. Perquisite or benefit given above 20,000. TDS is to be deducted at the rate of 10%. 194 S transfer of virtual digital asset buyer should deduct TDS at the rate of 1% if the transfer value is above 10,000 in all the cases in case the buyer is individual and HF 50,000 that's all for TDS pan and return two amendments are there updated return a new concept we will start now right now most important amendment in the pan you remember they last year also they have added if your electricity bill exceeds 1 lakh and if you do foreign travel. So they have put up some additional conditions that if you do this, you should obtain PAN. Usme or do add ho gaya. More to are added in that. Let us see what are they. Yeah. Compulsory application of PAN. Who should obtain PAN? In this, they have added rule 114 BA. Okay. And it says that if you are doing transactions, you remember PAN card is mandatory if your gross receipts exceed 5 lakhs. If you want to have GST and all, first 10 digit to PAN card, yeah, then 15 digit number. So you need to have PAN card in many cases, right? So three more cases they have added that before doing these transactions only you should have the PAN card. What is the first one in that? Every person who intends to deposit cash in his one or more accounts with a banking company or post office, if the cash deposit or aggregate amount of cash deposit in such account during the year is 20 lakhs or more. In one bank account or more than one bank account, but all the bank branches with the same core banking solutions, if you want to deposit cash, your own money, cash deposit, 194N is different. Huh? If you withdraw money above the limit, then go TDS. That is 194N. This is deposit. If you deposit above 20 lakhs in any of your bank account, you need to have PAN at least seven days before the date on which you want to deposit cash above 20 lakhs. Same way, if you want to withdraw cash from one or more banks, post office and all above 20 lakhs, okay, any account, saving account, any account, then seven days before withdrawing money, more than 20 lakhs from your own account, you need to have the PAN or who intends to open a current account or a cash credit. You know, CC limit, we hypothecate the stock and we take limit, we can overdraw our account or you are opening a current account for with a bank or with a cooperative society or post office, then you should have the PAN. So three more cases along with the five cases which are already there where you need to obtain the PAN. What are those three cases? First one, if you want to withdraw more than 20 lakh rupees from your own account 
or if you want to deposit more than 20 lakh rupees in cash in your own account in bank, in cooperative bank, in post office, or if you want to open a current account or an account with cash credit overdraft facility, you need to have PAN card first only. Okay? Right. Going back now, who is the person who is required to file the return? Ma'am, if your income exceeds basic exemptions before any deduction, you are required to file the return. If you are a company LLP partnership firm, irrespective of your income, you need to file the return. Mandatory. So there are cases wherein mandatorily you need to file the return. In that added is Rule 12A. I know these are all like technical terms or isko ek bar to aapko yaad hi karna padega. So you will have need to have repeat it like again and again. Can you read ABC which are already there since? Pehle se hai A, B and C. If you feel only this much is enough, pause the video, revise these 194 RS and this much or updated return baad mein dekhna but read it thoroughly repeat it twice and thrice take this material and you will prepare it super well for your exams along with this i have put up marathon videos also one and two for direct taxation for costing so do check that also it's there in the playlist link and soon when the rtps come definitely i'll discuss all the rtps mtps for cacma exams sure <clears throat> Any person other than company firm who's not required to file the return, he would have to file the return if he deposits aggregate amount exceeding 1 crore in one or more current account maintained. So in current account, if you deposit more than 1 crore, you have to file return. Foreign travel above 2 lakhs, you have to file return. Electricity bill exceeding 1 lakh, if you are paying, you have to file the return. So this is already there. Added to this is Rule 12 AB. Which says, if your turnover or gross receipts in the business exceeds 60 lakhs during the year, you need to file your return. Ma'am, but if my turnover is 70 lakhs, but my income is 10,000, 50,000, basic, no problem. If your turnover exceeds 60 lakhs during the year, you have to file return. If your turnover exceeds 1 crore, you have to get your books of accounts audited. If the gross receipts in case of professionals, doctors, lawyers, chartered accountant, if your professional income exceeds 10 lakhs, you have to file the return. Now, you know, I had a different mindset, dear students. To be very honest with all of you, I thought along with this, if I can discuss 44 AA and 44 AB limits, it will be helpful. Yes or no? You can comment below. More than a teacher, I feel as a student, how you will remember this and score marks in exam. So 44 A is, itne limit ke beyond hai, you have to maintain books. 44 A B, beyond this limit, you have to get your books audited. And beyond this limit, you have to file your return. So frankly speaking, these limits, we should discuss it together. Thus far confused, but when you put it like this, no, you will be more clear. But not right now. I'll promise I'll make a separate video for you. So subscribe to this channel if you have not done. Surely you will get a notification. And more clarification for updated and amendments will come. But if I put everything, it will pile up amendment to digest. Karlo. Two, three times you revise this lecture. Then I'll bring comparative. Same I thought with this. Now withdrawing more than 20 lakhs. One a pan lena padega. Ab, if crore se zada withdraw kar rahe, 194 n lag ja rahe, hai na? To like this once again, what are the cases wherein you need to file the return mandatorily? If you deposit more than 1 crore in your bank account or in cash or one or more bank account, cash mein deposit kar rahe, 2 lakhs se zada foreign travel hai, more than 1 lakh electricity bill, added to this is if your turnover exceeds 60 lakhs, you need to file your return. If your gross receipts exceed 10 lakhs, you need to file your return. If aggregate of TDS and TCS during the year, in case of person is 25,000 or more, 
in case of senior citizen fifty thousand or more. Mera jo TDS kata hai har jagah. If my TDS TDS is for the year, my TDS TDS is already deducted twenty five thousand. Means I must be earning some income, no? So TDS is deducted. So I need to file return. If I am a senior citizen. If my TDS deducted or TCS collected milake is above fifty thousand, I need to file my return. Deposit in one or more saving account in aggregate is fifty lakhs or more. I know you will need time to remember these sections. I'm not uh, boosting myself or I'm not here to criticize. It's being like very honest with all of you, dear students. Many times they say. That teachers are covering up all the amendments, but they leave off this part because these are the limits, है ना technical है ना आप देख लोगे और ये when a teacher brings it, it's like a challenge for them to bring all this together. One ninety four R S one thirty nine updated written. These are the highlight amendments. But in exam, when they say amendments are all the amendments, so three cases wherein you need to obtain the pan. Do remember it for your MCQs and small questions. And what are the cases where you need to file the return now? If your turnover exceeds sixty lakhs in business, ten lakhs gross receipts, TDS TCS. If you have exceeded twenty five thousand, say, or in case of senior citizen, if your TDS deducted by someone else is fifty thousand, you need to file the return. And if Deposit in one or more saving account is more than fifty lakhs. You need to file the return mandatory by the due date given in one thirty nine one. Okay, so here we have covered all the major major amendments in the part two. O T T B हो गया है. Updated return will take time. Updated return is pending and two not six C double A wala. This is also pending. One second. Yes. Was going in a flow. Let me check with all your doubts, and we'll complete the updated return also. Yeah, sure, sure. Hmm. Chalo, reverse. I'll go. Whatever are your doubts, you ask. Two thirty four H is clear. Five hundred fees and thousand pan. I know you'll have to repeat it a lot. And what are the cases wherein you need to file your return? Updated return. I'm discussing. One ninety four R is for the perquisite. One ninety four S is there. Which point? One second, ah, uh, one second. Because if doubt is there in your mind, you are not listening to what next time saying. I always say this in the regular class. Yeah. In case of VDS, one ninety four S is applicable. Buyer will deduct the TDS now at the rate of one percent for specified person. One percent if the limit exceeds fifty thousand. Specified persons are individual in HCF ke case me. One ninety four S is applicable if their turnover exceeds this limit. If they are doing the business, if they are not doing the business, anyhow it is applicable. Followed or not? Individual in HCF not having any income under business and profession. Is this applicable or not? Answer is yes. I'm not doing any business, but I have purchased uh, this. Uh, what do you call Bitcoin and all? Shall I deduct TDS? Yes. Above what limit? Huh? Fifty thousand for individuals and HFs. And if they have business, then VDA. You know why they are giving these business limits, dear students? Listen. No, VDA. Me, I want to clarify individuals and in HFs also. TDS is applicable above fifty thousand. For others, ten thousand. But for individual HF business, why they have given that fifty thousand uh, limit? If you are covered in tax audit, is 
there are people who are showing VDA as stocks also. They buy and sell. Okay. So will that still be taxable? Will the TDS be deducted? Yes. Once again, I'm clarifying. 194S says, if the virtual digital asset is transferred, TDS is to be deducted by the buyer at the rate of 1% if the transfer value exceeds 10,000. And in case of individual NHF, if the limit exceeds 50,000. In case of individual NHF who are doing business, 50,000 is the limit if the books of accounts are audited. Last part now we want to go is updated return. I feel whatever I talk about updated return is less because so much, so much, so much they are all talking. Let me explain and uh, in my way and then we will <clears throat> read out also. One second, dear students. Is the screen all clear to all of you? Hmm. I'm starting with a new topic called as updated return, section 139, 8A. 139.8a. I'll tell you all the points, whatever best I can, and then we will shift. One thirty nine eight a. We will start with. Chalo. Now this says that say we are in the financial year twenty two twenty three. So for this financial year, you have to file the return by July 2023. Late may late by December 2023. You all know earlier the time limit was till the end of the assessment year. So financial year 2023 return, you could file till March 24. But now it is not there. Belated return, if you have missed the date, you can file till Mar December 23. If you have missed this, now you have got a chance to file updated return under section 139.8a up to two years from the end of relevant assessment year. So 20 to 23. 22-23, where is it ending assessment year? 23-24. So from March 2024 till March 2026. Two years from the end of the relevant year May, you can file updated return. This was not there till last year to December tak ho gaya. And even if you file the return late, you have to pay 234A fees plus 234A fees. I will give you an overview of this. If you feel comment below, I will make separate one hour detailed, more detailed video for updated return. I feel not required. Too much of extra discussion also confuses the students from exam point of view. So I'm not doing it right now. But if you feel no, you need more inputs, do let me know in the comment box. And if you feel these amendment and marathon videos are helpful, comment below. I'll prepare more that motivates me and promise you pass it on at least to five of your friends. Let this conceptual knowledge reach to many people. Thank you in advance for that. Chalo. Now, 20 to 23 is the financial year. 23, 24. So from end of 24 till two years, I can file this return. That is March 26th. I can do. Okay. Right. Is this clear to all of you? March 26. Hmm. Now, is it necessary to file the original return and then the updated return? Can they do this? I filed original return. 
यू नो फ्रेंकली आई एम सेइंग अपडेटेड इसकी जरूरत क्या है अपडेटेड रिटर्न इज आई कैन से एन एमनेस्टी स्कीम की तरह इट इज लाइक ऑल विन विन सिचुएशन फॉर गवर्नमेंट गवर्नमेंट इज सेइंग इफ यू फॉरगॉटन एंड इफ यू फील बाय पेइंग एक्स्ट्रा टैक्स यू कैन अपग्रेड योर रिटर्न डू इट बट मैम आई हैव फाइल्ड माय रिटर्न एंड आई वांट टू रिड्यूस माय इनकम ब्लू so updated return can be filed if you have filed original return and you have missed out anything you want to add on the income can you file the updated return yes if you missed the original return you have not filed the return only for 23 year ending 24 ho gaya you have not filed can you file the updated return yes but i have to show income so one point should be like chewed pura kha jana hai in updated return you cannot <clears throat> reduce your income you cannot show losses if you miss the losses to to updated aur uska date chale gaya to you cannot say are i miss the due date and i'm filing updated return and i want claim for losses no updated return cannot be filed to claim losses updated return cannot be filed to reduce your income updated return cannot be filed to claim a refund to karein kyu updated return file if you have not shown some income and if you are ready to pay see updated return aise nahi mil raha they gave you time limit 31st july and by december if you file the return late already 234a interest is charged 234f fees is there 5000 you study that separately now sab padhane gaye to mushkil hai to already july return if you are filing in december you are paying the fees you are paying the interest now if you are filing updated return you need to pay additional tax of 25% and some cases 50% ab dekho kahan kya what will come check original return if you have filed under 13911 or 13914 belated or 13915 belated return revised return can you file updated return answer is yes but updated return aapne file kar liya ab fir se karenge kya updated return no only once updated return you can file only once okay original return mein loss hai can't you can't decrease loss you can't claim refund okay you can't uh, loss hai aur agar aap loss ko uh, kam kar rahe hain to bhi you cannot file the return for loss only ultimate aim is that in the updated return you are paying additional tax to government so you cannot claim a refund you can't reduce your income in the updated return are all the details clear this was just a brief opening up or a tax kis pe kaise pay hoga i really feel if you are really interested in learning updated return pause and first go and check if you miss on the due date you need to pay 234a interest and 234f so study that thoroughly then come to this this will be like super clear chalo updated return i am going any person whether or not he has furnished the return if you have missed out and directly you want to file updated return go for it but pay the tax pay the additional tax interest fees all so if a person has not furnished a return he may furnish an updated return or income of any other person in respect of it sometimes i am accessible as a representative ssc for my minor child for an unsound person for them also can i file the updated return if i have not filed the return answer is yes okay and it can be filed in prescribed way any time within 24 months from the end of the relevant assessment so your financial year is 22 23 your assessment year is 23 24 and from here two years march 26 tak you can file updated return i think dear students this being first exam they'll ask you very basic uh, questions two marks mujhe lagta hai to aisa nahi hai ki you have to leave the topic 
but you learn what is important. I don't want to dive in and make a two-hour lecture of updated return and God knows. Not required, I think, at this phase. Non-applicability. An updated return cannot be filed if the updated return is a return of loss. I told you, you cannot file a return for loss. Oh, I missed and now I want to claim the loss. 139.3, if you want to write down here, 139.3, not allowed. Or it has the effect of decreasing the total tax liability. Huh? In nutshell, a person cannot reduce his tax liability for updated return. Or it results in refund or increasing the refund. You cannot get a refund. You cannot reduce your tax liability. You cannot include your losses. These cases may you cannot file updated return. There are more cases wherein you cannot file updated return. You know, like for basic case, huh? Raid movie, Ajay Devgan's movie. You all have seen or not? So much of crores of rupees, coins and money and gold is recovered. Now, anything unexplained recovered from your home, flat 78% you have to pay tax, 60% tax, 25% surcharge, 4% HS, uh, higher education, uh, this says, E says we have to pay. So 78% tax pay karne se cha, people will smartly go chalo, I'll file updated return and do this. No, you're not allowed. Updated return cannot be filed if there is a search going on, rate going on, or a survey is requisitioned under 133A. Or a notice has been given for money, Julian, valuable, seized in case of any other person. There is no raid at my place, but my sister is staying in Gujarat and there's raid at her place. And from there, they feel suspicious that she might have transferred some illegal Benami properties, FDs in my locker. And I have got notice. Can I file updated return? No. A notice has been issued that books of accounts documents seized in case of other person pertains to Huh? This all you will study in survey in final that sometimes it's the survey and raid on me. Updated return, not allowed. If there's a survey raid on a third person, but they feel that, uh, you know, uh, property and all is uh, hided in my case also, then can they transfer it to my AOs and can I get notices and all? Yes. In that case, can I file updated return? No. Huh? Right? No updated return shall be filed where an updated return has already been furnished. So this is only one time. You know, this reminds me of a beautiful concept. Revised return, can it be revised? Yes. I revised my return. Again, if something is missed out, can I revise? Yes. Original return, can it be revised? Yes. Belated return, can it be revised? Yes. Revised return, ye na badi common story a routine. Updated return. Can it be revised again? Answer is no. So once again, there are cases wherein you cannot file the updated return. And these are those cases. They can ask you a small theory question on this. Now, updated return can be filed only once. Proceeding for assessment, reassessment is pending. Then you cannot file updated return. And these are the cases wherein department is working in a different way for you. Like AO has information regarding any SSE under the Smugglers and Foreign Exchange Manipulators Act, Benami Property Act, Prevention of Money Laundering, Black Money. So this is almost like equal to some raid or survey going on. In that case, updated return cannot be filed. Okay? If... Information is there with the department for uh, transfer pricing provisions that you have an agreement and there is something, then also updated return cannot be filed. Any prosecution proceedings have been initiated for the assessment year for the same updated return cannot be filed. Once again, updated return can be filed two years from the end of the relevant assessment year. Whether you have filed original return, you can. If you have not filed directly updated return, you can. But there are cases wherein updated return cannot be filed. If this much is clear, then let us talk about loss return. If a person has sustained a loss 
and has furnished a return of loss, verified and all. Okay. He shall be allowed to furnish an updated return where updated return is a return of income. You cannot file updated return and claim loss. But if you have already filed original return, original return as loss, updated return as income, is it allowed? Answer is yes. Okay. But if you have converted this loss into income, this loss, suppose this loss return was for 2021. And you have set off these loss, no? But now for that loss, you are filing updated return as income. So that loss set off related all 20 to 23 returns also will be revised. If loss or any part thereof is carry forward, unabsorbed depreciation is carry forward, you know, tax credit, MAT credit, AMT credit is there. It is to be reduced. Then as a result of furnishing updated return, updated return shall be furnished for each of this year. Did you get this point or not? There was a loss return for 2021. So for 21, Assessment year ending 22. 22 assessment year ending 24. Till 24. Can you file updated return? Yes. So there was a loss return. Now you have shown income in the updated return. But that loss of 20 you have set off in 21 and all. So for all those years also updated return. Suppose I took a mat credit in the year 2021 <clears throat> of 5 lakhs. Now I want to reduce it to 1 lakh. So related to that, whatever set off is done in the coming years, for all those years, you'll have to file an updated return. <clears throat> now when we file routine return, we say self-assessment tax should be paid. Like that, updated return should be accompanied with additional tax, which is to be paid under section 140B. Otherwise, your return is treated as defective return. Okay. Now, what is 140B? Hmm? This is all I have given, but only just if you remember, na, ye part ke liye to enough hai. if you know the TDS chapter, you will understand this better. 140B says, if you file the updated return after expiry of the time, but before completion of 12 months from the assessment year, from the assessment year, you have two years time. So within 12 months, if you file 25% of additional tax, you have to pay. Already you are paying original tax plus surcharge plus ESS plus interest. Say all this is coming to file act. On file act straight 25% extra tax. They are calling it as extra tax, dear students, just like a penalty. Amnesty scheme mein jate hain, penalty to lagti hai na? Like that. If you file your return, updated return after 12 months, but before 20 months from the end of the relevant assessment year, then 50% of the aggregate tax, they call it, but I call it additional tax on original tax plus surcharge plus ECS plus interest. I want all of you to remember here and write down not on 234F fees. 234F fees to lagega 5,000. But on that, you don't have to pay additional tax. While calculating this additional tax, you have to consider these already tax which you have paid in the form of advanced tax TCS. This concept we already applied in 234 ABC. For sake, if no return is filed and if you are filing updated return, then you have to pay tax after considering advanced tax, TDS, TCS, if you have paid salary relief or any other transfer related reliefs if you are getting. Same way here also. If you have already filed the return and if you have already paid the tax, now additional tax, on the original tax, surcharge, ECS, additional tax, on the total tax, you can reduce whatever tax you have already paid. That's all for the updated return. 
there's a very small amendment in uh, uh, 206 i'll say the gist but i want you to read but fir se ek bar updated return updated return it can be filed two years from the end of the relevant assessment year the due date of filing the rate late return is december of the assessment year march assessment year khatam ho raha wahan se two years tak you can file updated return but only you have to add on income and on additional income pay additional tax at the rate of 25% if updated return is filed within first 12 months of the end from the end of relevant assessment year otherwise 50% updated return cannot be filed if there is like uh, loss is increasing or you want to claim the refund and all and if you're caught up in search survey smugglers and all those cases updated return is not going to be filed it's not allowed you read it surely i'm saying there is more i can talk about updated return but everything cannot be fitted like this and i feel lot of times repetition is required so tax amendment video lecture 3 will surely cover up all this plus more before i end one common thing for tds and tcs is the i am the deductor you are the deductor you should give me pan if you don't give pan i will deduct tds at the higher rate you all remember at the tax rate in force or 20 percent whichever is higher tcs at five percent normally tcs rate is one or two percent he said notes me like i'm just saying orally because ye itna enough hai. So, listen to TDS and TCS common provisions are there, 206AA. They say that if PAN card is not given by the buyer, deduct the TDS at higher rate of the three. Rate applicable, rate in force or 20%, whichever is higher. Here it is 5%. To this, they have added from this year. Last year bhi tha, but they said if someone is a defaulter in filing the return, I call them non-tax filers you know someone is not filing the return till last year it was ki do saal tak return nahi bhara hai na to deduct the tds at the higher rate from this year they made it to one year last one year if you have not filed the return then also tds will be deducted at higher rate 20 percent tcs at five percent one or two cases it is like one person who's a act me likha now you know a person is not even giving the pan and he's defaulter he has not even filed his last year's return then tds or tcs will be deducted at higher of all the rates tcs ka apna higher rate hai 5% and yahan pe 20% just show you read it if you have any doubt i know i've given like too much extra information for this small part ki instead of 2 years now non return filers of 1 year you should consider but without that, you cannot learn this. See, 206A. If you are not having the PAN, deduct the TDS 20%. So, if O or QK case may 5%. Huh? 206AA tha. 206AB. If the person is a specified person who has not filed his income tax return and due date of filing the return is over, like for 21 and 22, this should be. Hmm. So you have to consider the due date of filing the return is over and TDS is 50,000. Then TDS is to be deducted at twice the rate or 5%. If he is both, PAN bhi nahi de raha hai, to bhi higher rate of TDS kato. He is giving PAN, but he has, he's a defaulter. He has not punished his return of last year then deduct at 5%. And if both are there, then higher. I want to repeat. Deducti, you are not giving PAN, 20%. Deducti, you are not, not filed your return for the last year for which due date of the filing the return is also over and your TDS is above 50,000. We will deduct the TDS at the higher rate, twice the rate of 5%. If you are both defaulter in both case, then 20%. Same is for TCS. In case of TCS, if the person is not giving the PAN, then 5%. One case only, it is 1%. If the person is giving the PAN, but he's a defaulter, he has not filed the return of last year, 
and due date of filing the return is over. Okay. And TDS and TCS is above 50,000. Then 5%. Followed or not. Here both the cases. Pan nahi diya na. Deducti ne. To bhi 5%. Defaulter in the return na. Last year ke le. To bhi 5%. Here. Pan nahi diya to 20%. Defaulter hai. Of not file the return in case of TDS to 5%. I feel if you read that in detail, you will get it. But if you feel somewhere I have gone little fast and if it is not clear, we'll surely cover it up in the tax amendment lecture three. Thank you so much for watching the video till end. Take best notes of these amendment lectures. And with this, dear students, revise the amendment lecture of last year also. Last year ke amendment bhi pushte hain. They are there in the playlist and marathon lectures all are there. Any doubts are there. And if you enjoy these conceptual learning, download the Concept Classes app and check the Fast Track and other lectures if you wish to join. All the best to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.